you need to give yourself space to to kind of sit there a day because you know this was on Friday, nothing happened on Saturday. A day for it to sink in. And despite all the wonderful things you've seen, all the wonderful things he said, you saw him die. That awful death. And he is dead, dead, dead. He's in a closed tomb. He's dead. Before anybody knows what has happened, an angel arrives at the tomb and there's another earthquake. And the angel rolls away the stone. He's dressed in lightning white and he just propped up on that stone. Not surprisingly, the guards uh, faint. They faint. I would too. So now the women are coming. Sabbath is over, now it's Sunday. At sunrise on Sunday, they're going to go and perform the ritual anointing of the body. They're wondering uh, who's gonna open the tomb for us. They get there and it's already rolled away. It's very difficult to follow the sequence but when they see that the stone is rolled away and he's not in there, it doesn't say when, but evidently uh, Mary Magdalene, who was one of the people coming, must have gone to tell the disciples. But somewhere along this time, uh, the women go into the tomb, they see the angel, and he tells them what, what has happened. They're surprised. Uh, they're upset. And the angel explains, you're looking for Jesus of Nazareth, who was crucified? He is risen. He's not here. Go, tell his disciples, Peter. He's ahead of you going to Galilee. You're going to see him there, just like he told you. We learn from Matthew's account, there were two angels there. Other things they said... Why do you look for the living among the dead? And remember what he told you back when he was, when you were all in Galilee. He said he had to be handed over to sinful people and be crucified. He also said he'd be raised on the third day. So they return in stunned silence. They do remember what he said, but still they're running out of the tomb, trembling and afraid. And at first, they don't tell anybody. the first day of the week, we learn that on that Resurrection Sunday, the news began to spread early about the empty tomb. At this point, no one has seen Jesus. But we do learn from John chapter 20 that Mary Magdalene goes and tells Peter and John about the empty tomb. Apparently, she was in the group that earlier had seen the empty tomb, and although not all the women left, it appears that Mary Magdalene left at that time. And what she tells Peter and John is not the expression of faith that you would hope to hear. She says that somebody took the Lord out of the tomb. And so Peter and John run to the tomb. John looks in, and he sees just the grave clothes left there. Peter actually goes into the tomb and finds that the face cloth is rolled up separately. Then John comes in and he believes. Until now, it says he had not understood the scripture. And so then they return home. Sometime around this time, according to Matthew chapter 28, the guards who observed the rolling away of the stone and the appearance of the angels and the empty tomb collude with Jewish leaders to cover up 
the resurrection. The soldiers report what they saw, and they go not to the Roman officials, but to the chief priests and elders who bribed them to spread a rumor. The chief priests and elders want the soldiers to say that the disciples stole the body while they slept. As weak an excuse as that is, that's what they wanted them to say. Now, it's a terrible thing for a soldier to spread the word that uh, something bad happened while they were asleep on the job. And so the chief priest and elders not only say that they will pay them, but they say that they'll keep him, or they'll keep the soldiers out of any trouble with the governor, I suppose, for saying that they were asleep. Matthew tells us that this arrangement started a rumor that was persistent even up to the time when Matthew was writing his account. Before we move on with resurrection appearances, I want to stop and notice who the women are that are involved at the cross and at the tomb and in the spreading of the news of the resurrection. There are as many as nine names or descriptions of women in the, these two instances as you look through all the various uh, accounts of the crucifixion and of the resurrection. Some of them almost certainly overlap. One suggestion is, if you notice the arrow at the top of the slide, that Mary, the mother of James and Joseph, is named in Matthew 27, 56. But in the next chapter, it says, the other Mary. And so that is apparently who it refers to. But there are other interpretations. These are the names of the people who were at the cross and at the tomb. Mary, the mother of Jesus. Mary's sister, Mary, the mother of James and Joseph, Mary, the wife of Clopas, Mary Magdalene, the other Mary, the mother of Zebedee's sons, Salome, and Joanna. Of these, those who are named as being witnesses of the resurrection, are Mary, the mother of James, Mary Magdalene, the other Mary, Salome, and Joanna. You might want to return to follow up on these and uh, get your best understanding of where these names overlap and who all is involved. Uh, it makes an interesting study. Back to the accounts of the witnesses of the resurrection. Now things have changed. Now Jesus himself appears. Apparently Mary Magdalene has returned to the tomb after telling Peter and John, and after Peter and John have visited the tomb. She is still mourning. She is crying outside the tomb and looks into that empty tomb where she sees angels where Jesus lay. And they, the angels ask her why she's crying. She says that she's upset because she doesn't know where they put him. At this point, Jesus is standing behind Mary, but she doesn't recognize him. She is obviously overcome with her grief. And so the man asks, standing behind her asks why she's crying. Who is it she's looking for? And not knowing who it is, she says, if you carried him away, tell me where and, and I'll get him. She's thinking he's the caretaker of, of the cemetery. At that point, Jesus calls her by name, Mary. Then she cries out, 
in Aramaic, Rabboni, teacher. And obviously, then she just grabs a hold of him. And he says, in essence, stop clinging to me. You go and tell the others that I'm returning to my father. And of course, she goes on. Returning to Matthew 28, there is another appearance, but this is apparently to the other women, not including Mary Magdalene. The women, as you remember, had been afraid, and yet they were joyful, and they run to tell the disciples about the empty tomb. But as they're going, Jesus appears and greets them. And so they fall down and worship him. He calms them, and he says, as a reminder, to tell the disciples that they're going to be meeting with him in Galilee. At some point around this time, and we don't know when it was, we get it from a backward look later in the text, Luke 24 tells us that at some time, Jesus appeared to Peter before he appeared to the other apostles. If you count Peter then, you now have three men who are going to see the risen Christ. The other two are men who are walking to a town near Jerusalem called Emmaus. Jesus, somehow hiding his identity, asks the two men on the road what they're talking about. One of them is named Cleopas. And he says, in essence, don't you know what happened? I've been heard about Jesus, the one that we hoped would redeem Israel and how our leaders had him crucified. And haven't you heard, there are now some women who report that they have seen that the tomb is empty and that they had an angel tell them that he's alive. And so... Jesus, still unknown to them, reminds them that the scripture had prophesied all of this. They have a meal with him, and at that time, they recognize Jesus. And then he goes away, he disappears. They say to each other, didn't we know that our hearts were burning as he opened the scriptures to us? Well, these men no longer want to go to Emmaus. They go back into Jerusalem. They rush to tell all the apostles. When they get there, the apostles are saying, the Lord is risen. He's appeared to Simon. So without knowing when it happened now, we know from this passage in Luke 24 that somewhere along the way, Jesus had actually appeared to Simon Peter. Then, still on the Resurrection Sunday, Jesus appears to his disciples gathered together, with one of them being absent. They're talking, and Jesus appears among them and says, Peace be with you. The disciples think it's a ghost. And to prove that he's really there, he wants them to see his hands and feet and come and touch to see that he has a body. He is not a ghost. They are so happy and so amazed that they just can't believe. It. He asked them to have something to eat. And he eats the fish that they provide right there in front of them helping them recognize him as alive in the flesh. And Jesus goes on to explain that this all fulfills what was said by Moses and the prophets and in the Psalms. In John 20, we also read that at this time, when he says, peace be with you, Jesus says, as the Father sent me, so I send you. 
then he breathes on them and says, receive the Holy Spirit. He authorizes them to extend forgiveness or withhold forgiveness as his representative. We're told, without being given the reason, that Thomas was not present with the other apostles when Jesus appeared to them. Of course, the apostles talk to Thomas and tell him, we have seen the Lord, but he will not believe it. Thomas says he won't believe it unless he feels the actual wounds of Jesus. A week passes. The disciples are meeting behind locked doors and Jesus suddenly comes to them. And he calls Thomas to him. And he says, feel the nail prints in my hand. Put your hand into this wound in my side. And then Jesus says to Thomas, stop doubting, believe. And Thomas does believe. In a highlight, a climax of the whole Gospel of John, he declares, my Lord and my God. Jesus acknowledges what a blessing it is that Thomas has come to believe with these physical proofs. But he goes on to say, blessed are those who believe even without seeing. John gives us a unique story of a resurrection appearance. Hard to say exactly when. Enough time has passed that uh, some of the disciples are back at work at the Sea of Galilee. You'll remember probably that Acts tells us that it was 40 days between the resurrection and the ascension. So evidently the uh, fishermen are out fishing again. And while they're out in the boat, Jesus comes to the beach at the side of Lake Tiberias, which is another name for the Sea of Galilee. They'd been working all night and didn't catch fish. At daybreak, Jesus calls out from the shore. They don't know who he is. And he basically says, you didn't catch anything, did you? And they say, no. And he says, put the net on the right side of the boat. They're not thinking that'll do much, but when they do, they catch so many fish that they can't pull them into the boat. They come to shore. They're about to have breakfast with Jesus. When Peter recognizes that it's Jesus, he jumps into the water from the boat and swims in to get there fast. The rest come on in, and they find that Jesus is already cooking fish over a fire. He has bread for them. And he tells them to bring some of their fish. The text very interestingly says there were 153 fish. That specific number sounds very much like an eyewitness account, someone who remembers a very fine detail of what was going on there. And what we're told here by John is that this is his third appearance to the disciples since the resurrection. This time, Jesus has a talk with Peter. He calls Peter to wrestle with what it means to love Jesus. He asks him, do you love me more than others? And he says, you know I do. And so Jesus says, then feed my lambs. He repeats the question with emphasis. Do you truly love me? And Peter says, you know I do. And again, he says, take care of my sheep. A third time, he says, do you love me? And Peter, in frustration, declares, you know I do. And he says, take care of my sheep. 
I know there are other interpretations, but what is repeated here is that one with truly great love for Jesus will tend to his disciples, take care of his sheep. He does have a personal message for Peter. He says, when you're older, others are going to control you. That does happen sadly as people get old, other people have to take care of you. But we're told that that's not all he's talking about, that he is describing how Peter's death will glorify the Lord. He is expressing how Peter will be captured and martyred. And in light of that, he says, but follow me. Then he turns his attention to John. That is, Peter turns his attention to John and says, well, what about him? Jesus says, what if he remains until I return? You follow me. And John tells us a rumor developed that that disciple would not die, but he says that's not what Jesus said. And in fact, John does live longer than the rest. And then John gives his personal testimony that what he's writing here, he's an eyewitness. This really happened this way. Putting them together in sequence is something of a challenge. But before Jesus goes back to heaven, he directs his apostles, his disciples, to spread the word of the gospel. One occasion when he does that is in Galilee, the one described in Matthew 28. He's told them to meet him on a mountain in Galilee, and the eleven, Judas being dead, meet him there on the mountain. And when they see Jesus there, they worship him. In spite of the fact that some people doubt, these eleven worship him. And in sending them to spread the gospel, he tells them to go make disciples of all nations, to baptize them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and to teach them to obey everything that Jesus commanded. Then Jesus promises that he will always be with them. Luke account, gives an account of another occasion when he talks about their mission. Now they're back in Jerusalem. And Jesus is explaining from Scripture why he had to suffer and why the resurrection is the great victory over all that suffering. Then he describes their mission as preaching repentance to all nations. He calls them witnesses of the things that happened in his life. He reminds them of the promise of the Spirit, and then he tells them that they are to stay in Jerusalem and wait for power from on high. The ascension of Jesus is recorded only by Luke, but in the Gospel of Luke and in the Book of Acts. He leads them towards Bethany, so they're on the Mount of Olives, and there he pronounces a blessing on them. We learn from the first chapter of Acts that the disciples think he's about to restore Israel's earthly kingdom. And Jesus corrects them gently, saying, it's not for you to know the Father's timetable. He tells them instead that they should concentrate on what he's promised. He repeats to them that they will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on them. And then he defines their work as being his witnesses in Jerusalem, 
in Judea and Samaria and all over the world. And then Jesus is taken up to heaven. They see him rise up. They see him hidden by a cloud. And then angels tell them, as amazed as you are, you need to know that Jesus is coming back the same way. Then Luke tells us that the disciples return joyfully to Jerusalem. 